So it's my pleasure to introduce Lucy Tran, who's a new NSF postdoc here at Berkeley. She is on one of the MVZ, the museum collections postdocs, and so she'll be spending time here in the MVZ as well as in my lab in ESPM. And uh, Lucy did her undergrad at UCLA and then just finished her PhD work last year with Lacey Knowles at University of Michigan. She has a bunch of really nice papers that came out of her dissertation, including one in AMNAD and one in Prokhorov Sock, one that's coming in AMNAD now, and one in Prokhorov Sock, so you'll be able to follow up and read the nitty gritty about all the cool work she's done. I don't know if you'll mention at the end the project that you're doing here, um, but um, another, so catch her at coffee sometime to ask her about the armadillo project she's starting, which is going to be really fun and is uh, quite different from this work, but uh, related somewhat conceptually. And Lucy's fun fact for the MVZ lunch today is that she actually applied and considered coming to ESPM as an undergraduate more than 10 years ago, and so we finally have our, have our chance. So welcome to Lucy, and glad to have her part of the MVZ community, and really glad to introduce her talk today, revisiting the scale dependence of the biotic, abiotic paradigm in evolutionary biology. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> um, so I just wanted to start out by saying that um, it's uh, quite an honor um, to be able to talk um, at, at NBC lunch, and especially just found out today that this is uh, Joseph Riddle's um, pointing stick, so it's an honor to be pointing with this stick. Um, so I just wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit about some of the projects that I did during my PhD at Michigan. Um, and generally, I'm interested in questions about what explains differences in um, biodiversity patterns across time and space. And um, we know that across numerous tax taxonom taxonomic groups that um, uh, species uh, diversity is unevenly distributed across space. An example of this is in amphibians, um, that uh, richness is mostly concentrated uh, at the lower latitude. Um, in the subtropics and tropics, and this is um, this is a pattern that we see again and again across the tree of life. So uh, this uneven pattern uh, of richness of space, like story suggests that uh, there are uh, non-random processes acting uh, to produce these patterns, and um, two major classes of factors that uh, we've historically. Um, talked about in terms of explaining the differences are um, bad factors and I'm sorry, abiotic factors and bad factors. And abiotic factors include things like changes in uh, large scale changes in climate, uh, tectonic changes like uplift of candies. Um, bad factors are mostly um, uh, involved with uh, intrinsic traits of species um, such as body size. Um, as well as interactions between species, like competition. Uh, and these two classes of factors um, <clears throat> modulate how uh, the diversification processes, such as uh, speciation and extinction, affect uh, biodiversity. <coughs> uh, so here, um, I'm just going to uh, say that I'm color-coded. Um, there's a lot of things that are color-coded. So, uh, abiotic factors are going to be in this uh, pastel purple color here in the rest of the talk, and then and, um, uh, orange um, for biotic factors. <coughs> so, uh, when we're thinking about the framework of how the scales at which biotic and abiotic factors um, operate to uh, um, shape differences in uh, species diversity, <coughs> um, we generally uh, think that. Um, biotic factors should only operate at very um, uh, small spatial scales and over short to intermediate um, time scales, whereas abiotic factors um, are thought to be more important over larger uh, spatial scales and um, longer temporal scales. Okay, this is um, this is a multi-level mixed model of Benton, introduced by or discussed by Benton in his two thousand nine paper. So, since since you know this uh, framework, since the uh, historical uh, sorry, uh, since the framework has been um, established, like a lot of uh, many empirical studies have said, have established that um, actually there doesn't seem to be as clear a distinction between the scales at which biotic and abiotic factors operate. Um, 
and that's what I was interested in um, for my PhD in um, looking at how uh, biotic and abiotic factors um, interact together um, uh, to influence differences in uh, diversity patterns and um, specifically in uh, the scales at which we should expect to see um, these two classes, major classes of factors, um, interacting. And I chose to look at um, this uh, question in the Burger Samples. Um, and um, they're, they're a good group to look at this question because they're, even though they're all um, in the same uh, trophic level, um, there's, uh, they, the species exhibit great variation um, <coughs> in their ecology, um, in body size, um, in the things that they eat, even. Um, and this is a phylogeny of um, all mammals, um, showing uh, color coded by the, um, their um, trophic level. So herbivores are um, colored in green, um, carnivores are in blue, and the omnivores are in purple. Okay, so you can see that um, herbivorous mammals um, are uh, distributed across the uh, phylogeny of mammals. Um, they're not, um, it's not long. And uh, one of the uh, major differences in the herbivores um, is in the uh, mode of digestive fermentation uh, <coughs> that they uh, utilize, uh, that they have evolved. And, um, and they've needed to, I want to step back and explain um, the significance of the mode of uh, digestive fermentation, um, because uh, herbivores are eating um, uh, plants and which contain cellulose and other um, uh, fibers that are not digestible on uh, <coughs> endogenous And um, the um, plants also produce secondary compounds that can be toxic uh, to consumers. Um, and so herbivores have, uh, mammalian herbivores, and also one bird actually, have evolved uh, foregut fermentation and um, hindgut fermentation to deal with some of the prob these problems. Um, uh, presented by their diet. And in um, foregut herbivores, um, there's a specialized uh, region of um, the stomach that houses endo um, endosymbiotic bacteria that uh, digest the cellulose um, that these herbivores are eating. Whereas in um, hindgut fermenters like bats, um, the, the specialized um, uh, region occurs in the cecum. Um, where bacteria are housed. Okay. And foregut fermentation is uh, fairly rare in um, the mammals. It's only evolved for individual, uh, four independent times um, in uh, the macropod marsupials, so things like quaggas, this cute thing here, um, and kangaroos and their allies, uh, tree floss. Um, most of the artiodactyls, including ruminants, um, and in a uh, wide group of primates, the colobine monkeys. <coughs> okay. So um, there have been a lot of um, hypotheses uh, floating around um, in uh, the uh, old literature about what the ecological consequences of these two digestive strategies uh, should involve. And, um, the two strategies uh, involve differences in digestive efficiency, um, whether there's uh, a, an, addition, an additional source of protein that's available to uh, herbivores, and also in the uh, gut passage time, uh, which is the rate at which food uh, um, uh, is processed. So uh, in foregut herbivores, digestive efficiency is high, higher. Um, they're able to, um, because the, the specialized structure for housing uh, endosymbiotic bacteria is located in the stomach, um, they're able to uh, digest the microbes um, um, after they provide, after they've digested the cellulose, and that provides an additional source of protein. And this is an important point um, because herbivores um, often experience like very protein limited diets. Um, they're eating things like grasses, especially where um, leaves are high in silica. Um, leaves are not especially good, but like grasses or 
there's some um, qualified monkeys that eat only lichen. So you have very poor nutrient quality food. Um, and then uh, get passage rates are um, the, the offside of having these uh, advantages is that um, gut passage time, time uh, rate is very, very slow comparatively and for gut fermenters. And um, that means that um, that they're, um, uh, even though they're very efficient at uh, processing the food, digesting the food, um, they can, they're limited in um, the, the amount of food that they can process at any given time compared to the kind of fermenters. So these, um, First, to uh, these uh, the, the digestive differences in digestive efficiency and the additional protein source um, have been hypothesized to um, result in uh, or to produce uh, differences in the niche effect of um, foregut versus hind uh, herbivores. Uh, specifically, that um, because they have higher uh, uh, digestive efficiency and um, the uh, able to obtain uh, more protein from their diet, that their uh, niche width should be uh, greater in four dead Um But um, because uh, they're limited um, by uh, the amount, of, the quantities of food that they can eat, um, um, if there's uh, it changes in climate that affect um, the availability of um, plants that are high in uh, nutrient quality, um, then forget fermenters fermenters should be relatively more affected by those um, abiotic changes. And so if we're looking at um, the effect of uh, climatic fluctuations on richness, um, the uh, negative effect should be greater in four dead fermenters. Okay, and I'll be um, looking, I'll be uh, returning to these ideas um, later in the talk. So, um, so I, I told you that this was sort of like the, the question of like how the, the question I'm interested in is how biotic and abiotic factors um, uh, should interact at the same scale. So for uh, all the projects um, that <coughs> I'll be talking about um, later, um, I have uh, selected uh, the same um, geographical and temporal scale, um, and that's um, at large spatial scales and um, long temporal scales, um, what, um, how do biotic and abiotic factors um, interact and if they do at all. Um, <coughs> this is sort of like a, a gray area in terms of our understanding of um, which factor should be uh, primarily um, important controlling uh, diversity. Okay. <coughs> so my first project, um, I'll be focusing on um, an abiotic factor um, in the form of ecological opportunity and asking specifically um, how does ecological opportunity uh, does and how does ecological opportunity explain differences in um, richness that we observe um, across continental lineages of the same, um, uh, the same uh, uh, group of monkeys, the colonized monkeys. So, an ecological, uh, there's a whole body of uh, models of uh, uh, adaptive radiation that uh, propose that ecological opportunity. So things like um, echinovation, um, uh, like the pharyngeal uh, jaw that's evolved in some uh, cichlid species, or um, like the, the uh, availability of new habitat, novel habitat or the extinction of predator species or predator species. Um, all of these, all of these um, would provide lineages with a, a novel niche space in which to, um, uh, in which to uh, diversify it. Okay. And um, that, that would uh, potentially lead to uh, rapid cessation and morphological diversification. So, um, uh, to test uh, these ideas about how ecological opportunity um, should affect uh, morphological as well as um, lineage diversification, um, uh, many empirical studies have focused on uh, one particular model, uh, which is the early burst model, 
and in the early verse model, uh, basically uh, proposes that as spe species or as, as a language <coughs> begins to um, occupy uh, un, uh, un, or begins to occupy um, unfilled niches um, due to ecological opportunity, um, that uh, they should uh, evolve diverse morphological forms as well as um, species. Um, and um, the caveat is that um, over time, the number of available niches will fill up. And when that happens, uh, both rates of uh, lineage and morphological diversification should um, decline. Okay? So focusing on the rate of uh, lineage accumulation, um, if we look at the number of lineages over time, uh, we should see uh, this pattern in that um, the rate of lineage accumulation is fairly um, steep in the beginning. This is uh, concordant with uh, when uh, lineages are diversifying into the unoccupied niches. And then um, over time, as the niches are filled, the rate of uh, speciation should um, decline. Okay. Um, and, to hit, uh, and to test uh, for temporal declines in um, morphological diversification, um, a, a tool, um, a common tool, is um, a, what's called a node height test, which is illustrated here. And um, so, the node, uh, like node heights, are just simply uh, the distance from um, the mo most recent common ancestral node um, to all the other nodes in the phylogeny. Um, and so. The nodes that are um, node heights that are smaller represent um, older nodes um, that are closer to the root of the tree, whereas node heights that are larger, so for example, for here and here, represent um, um, nodes that are um, more lo located more towards the, the tip of the tree. Okay, and independent contrast is just a phylogenetically corrected value of um, whatever morphological trait you're looking at. Um, and the uh, node height test works, uh, detects a, a slowdown in um, morphological, the rate of morphological diversification um, by um, testing a relationship between uh, your uh, morphological, uh, uh, your continuous morphological variable and node height. Um, and if there's a negative relationship, that means that um, morphological diversification was high um, um, farther back in the tree, so earlier in the radiation, uh, whereas it's uh, slower um, near the tips of the tree or um, more toward the present. Okay. So um, I tested uh, for a slowdown in both rates of uh, lineage accumulation with biological diversification in the Colobi monkeys. Again, um, the Colobi monkeys are the only four yet to maintain um, uh, primates. And uh, this is uh, a good group to test uh, this idea because um, we see um, there's a, there, the, these monkeys are um, distributed across two different continents in Africa and Asia, and we see a, a disparate pattern of richness on the two continents, and that um, there are many, many more uh, Asian species than in Africa. Um, and we also have a good idea of um, the dispersal history of the ancestral Asian colony. Okay. Oh, and um, I should point out that here um, and the rest of this part, um, I've uh, color-coded uh, African columbines in purple and then um, the Asian uh, columbines in yellow. <coughs> okay, so um, when I looked at um, the uh, uh, rate of lineage accumulation through time um, for these two continental radiations, um, I found that um, there's no difference in uh, the, the rate in the African clade versus um, a, a delayed burst uh, and then decline in rates. So um, let me, let me um, take a step back and explain what these plots mean for those of you who are or I'm um, still so familiar with looking at uh, what is that through time plots. Um, so basically, the, the 
solid black line um, is the median number of images over time. Um, the dashed lines represent um, the ex no expectation of uh, the number of lineages uh, from a pure birth process, um, so with only speciation happening, um, methylogeny. And um, the shaded regions represent the 95% confidence interval. Okay? And so um, you can see that, um, that uh, the absorbed number of lineages um, actually only the rate of uh, speciation only uh, departs significantly. Um, in the Asian clade. Okay. Um, and what's interesting here is that instead of observing um, uh, this like change in lineage accumulation or latent radiation, it should be it should have happened around here. Um, uh, according to the early first model, um, I instead found um, that uh, it happened much later on in the, ra in the radiation. Of um, Asian colonies. So, what, you know, what's going on here? Um, and I will return to that later. So, um, so that was sort of a qualitative assessment of the, the change in uh, the rate of lineage accumulation. Um, when I tested it uh, quantitatively using um, the, uh, the constant race test, um, uh, I found that. Uh, Yes, it does appear that there was a, a, a decline um, in, in um, uh, lineage accumulation rates um, only in the Asian clade. Okay, and um, let me explain what this means. So the constant rates uh, test, um, the gamma statistic is from the constant rates test, and what it does is that um, in a balanced phylogeny. In which uh, rates have been like rates of speciation um, have been constant, um, you should expect that uh, most of the nodes in a phylogeny are concentrated at the midpoint. Okay, and this is what this shows. Um, whereas in a clade that experienced um, early rapid uh, diversification, you should see um, the concentration. The node, most of the nodes are actually shifted um, more towards the root. And that is reflected in a negative gamma statistic. And um, in a clade that's actually experienced accelerated rates of uh, lineage accumulation, we should see, see the concentration of nodes in the phylogeny shift more towards the tips of the phylogeny. And that would be a more positive gamma statistic. Okay? Um, and so uh, when I uh, did simulations of um, 5,000 phylogenies. I found that the mean gamma um, was significantly um, uh, lower, like uh, lower um, than expected, which is consistent with a uh, decline in uh, lineage accumulation over time. Okay. And um, the, the gamma statistic was not significant in that degree, which makes sense given uh, the lineage through time um, patterns that I showed earlier. So, um, What's interesting is that you should only expect to see uh, the negative gamma statistic. Um, traditionally, uh, when uh, a lineage um, satisfies um, the early burst model, okay. So uh, remember that I found um, a change in the rate of lineage accumulation. It wasn't early in the radiation; it was much later than expected. But this test is, um, seems to be insensitive to when the actual change in um, uh, speciation rate occurs, okay? When I looked at um, changes in the rate of morphological diversification over time, um, I found that um, um, the, the uh, relationship was not significant in the African clade, again, um, but was for the Asian clade. And, um, was uh, interestingly, it was in the opposite direction as expected. So instead of uh, seeing a decrease, you guys will recall, um, in uh, the, uh, a negative relationship which reflects like a decrease in morphological rates and morphological evolution, I see an increase in um, 
for both uh, mandible shapes and um, these other characters that I looked at. And so the two, what is uh, So the two plots on the left, here and here, are um, it, as a relationship is a node of the re results of the node height test for a mandible shape, and I also looked at other um, like dental characteristics like the length, breadth, and um, area of um, molar teeth um, and other traits related to uh, dental morphology. And um, for both mandible shape and um, the dental traits, I found um, a, a surprising positive relationship um, between node heights and the traits. And this sort of makes sense within the context of um, and that I found the delayed burst and bridge accumulation. And so at first I was sort of like, you know, perplexed about all these different pieces of um, the, the puzzle. I was trying to like, why did I see the, the delayed burst? Um, you know, why, why do I see, why did I see um, um, uh, an increase in the rate of morphological evolution instead of a decrease? And um, when I thought about it within the context of the geographical, um, or sorry, in the, the biogeographic history of uh, that, the African and Asian clades, uh, it made perfect sense. And um, this is because uh, during like the uh, mid-Miocene, ancestral Asian colobines dispersed from Africa um, through Eurasia to um, uh, South Asia and then uh, other parts of Southeast Asia. And you can see here that, um, so next to these are different uh, genera of colobine monkeys, and then the numbers below, the names are the number of species in each, in each genus. And you can see that as, as um, the ancestral colobines dispersed through, um, in particular, like uh, India and Myanmar um, and Malaysia, that um, a lot of the species should happen. And the, the groups that have um, lower diversity are the younger ones, um, who are found in you know, China and Vietnam and um, Borneo. So when, um, when the lineage uh, encountered like, all this open space um, in uh, Asia as so it dispersed through these areas, um, lineage, the rate of speciation increased, which is secure. Um, and then it declined um, as they basically reached the, the last of the habitat suitable for these species. Okay. And that's consistent with the seeding, um, the, the uh, change in lineage accumulation much later, and also in the increased rate of morphological evolution that I saw as the decline, because it happened so much more recently in the, the Asian clade. So, um, to summarize um, this part, um, I found that neither of the hypotheses about how ecological opportunities should affect um, um, uh, rates of lineage accumulation <coughs> and ecological diversification were supported in the African clade, um, but were in the Asian clade, but were, um, uh, but in specialized cases. And that I found instead of uh, early births, I found delayed births. And um, an increase in the rate of morphological evolution through time, um, but like when I thought when the biogeographic history of these two uh, continent, continental radiations um, uh, was taken into consideration, these um, these uh, perplexing results actually make sense. Okay, so. From this, uh, the results from this part showed that um, yes, like we do see that that ecological opportunity, which is an abiotic factor, um, can affect rates of, sorry, um, can influence um, differences in uh, diversity at this scale. Okay. Um, and so um, I, um, I then moved to looking at the effect of. Um, and uh, a biotic factor on um, differences in um, diversity, and specifically looking at the effect of um, the uh, ecological specialization 
of species and explaining difference of variation in speciation rates in the rivers and animals. So, um, the, the common understanding is that um, in a purely uh, abiotic world, um, that we should see um, a, a species who are uh, ecological specialists should be more sensitive to pertur 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 perturbations in their environment, whereas species that are generalists should be uh, fairly more robust to such changes. As this is illustrated here. Um, that have you know species like squirrels um, that are, um, are yeah so um, like species that are specialists and um, they uh, speciation rates are thought to be higher um, because they can, they're more sensitive to changes and they can uh, like they're they're more sensitive to any particular um, uh, changes in their environment that. Uh, uh, provide more opportunities for vicariates or divergent selection, and so speciation rates are higher. But um, because they have very specialized ecologies, um, when there's a critical event, like say the Pleistocene Great Glaciations, they cannot, um, they're not able to respond as quickly to the environment, and um, so they would also um, experience greater extinction. Okay? Whereas for a generalist species, um, they have much generally have much broader um, uh, range sizes and um, uh, less specialized ecologies, um, you know, they tend to do fairly well through um, over time um, and even after, uh, you know, major changes in their environment. Um, but the flip side of that, that is that speciation rates are fairly, are much lower compared to specialist, uh, specialist species. But they also don't go extinct as often. So, um, so the expectation from uh, those processes is that a uh, speciation rate should decline as a function of um, the niche with the species. Um, in particular, um, uh, highly ex highly specialized species should uh, lineages should um, have. Uh, higher speciation rates than um, more general lineages. And I looked at this um, at the family level in the reverse animals. Um, and um, here is a uh, here is a, a depiction of the, the niche width and speciation rates of these 46 families. Um, and um, again, the, the blue lineages are the pine get forms of lineages and the, the red are the four different images. And um, I estimated speciation rates from the Bayesian um, Analysis and Microevolutionary Mixtures program developed by Dan Roboski um, at the University of Michigan. Um, and um, so, uh, so these speciation rates are um, actually average across uh, many models. Um, but they represent uh, our best idea of what uh, the, the rates um, look like across these families. So when I compared um, um, the uh, niche widths and speciation rates of floor debt versus high debt fermenters, um, for fermenting families, I found that there actually was no difference. Um, they're like floor debt fermenters are no more or less specialized than high debt fermenters fermenting families, uh, whereas, um, and it's the same thing with speciation rates. Speciation rates were, um, on average, quite similar between the two groups of fermenters. Um, but when I modeled the uh, relationship between um, speciation rate and um, um, niche width, I found that um, uh, a model with uh, niche width uh, with an interaction uh, term with strategy um, recovered the negative relationship um, that we would expect in the purely amniotic model. Uh, so, so that's sort of interesting, right? Because um, at least the the model um, postulates that um, that like only uh, that niche should have a negative 
effect on speciation rate only when you know climatic factors um, um, are uh, affecting lineages. But it seems that the for some reason the mode of fermentation um, also modulates this relationship. And um, the differences between the two groups is illustrated here, um, where uh, in um, the forget fermenting um, families, uh, we see that uh, specialists actually have lower um, speciation rates than, um, uh, than, as, uh, than generalists. Um, so that's, uh, again, the opposite um, relationship that we expect from the, the model, whereas um, the, the expected relationship is found for hunger worse. So again, you know, um, this like why 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 do um, um, why do um, uh, forget fermenting um, lineages that are generalists have higher speciation rates? We shouldn't expect that. So that's um, this is something I'll return to in my last the last part of my talk. Um, so to wrap up this part, I found that. Um, uh, contrary to uh, the um, uh, hypotheses about the ecological consequences of the two, mo two modes of fermentation, there are no differences in niche width between Borda and Heinegger herbivores. And uh, when we looked at, look at the effect of um, niche width and speciation rate, um, the expected relationship was recovered in Heinegger fermenters, but not for Borda fermenters, where niche width where generalists actually seem to have higher speciation rates um, than the specialist species. So, um, so here um, I showed that um, the uh, biotic uh, factor of niche width does affect um, diversity uh, in this group at this the scale. This scale. So, when I was talking earlier about the effect of um, niche width on um, patterns of diversity over time. I mentioned that it's not just niche width, right, that's uh, sort of modulating these um, patterns. It's also the occurrence of random, non random um, uh, uh, environmental perturbations. <coughs> and um, there are classical ideas about how um, climatic stability should affect um, diversity. And um, this is a question that, uh, that I looked at in, in the last um, project that I'll be talking about. So um, we, uh, we know that um, many empirical studies have shown that um, past historical uh, fluctuations in climate uh, seem to reduce biodiversity of whichever um, metric we, were, uh, um, we care about, whether it's endemism, uh, or uh, species richness or um, um, speciation rates. And here's an illustration for uh, in North America. Um, if in, in um, regions that experience high uh, climatic instability um, in the past, there, there are very, there are like no endemic species. Whereas if we look at um, the areas where that had that experienced much lower um, climatic instability, we see higher uh, higher numbers of endemic species. So, the the um, the relationship between past climatic instability and you know diversity is real. It seems to be real. And um, the idea is that um, uh, specifically that as instability. Um, climatic instability um, increases, um, that we should see a decline in diversity. And this is um, the historic climate stability hypothesis in the literature. Um, so when I looked at, um, before I present my results for the section, I just wanted to like, walk you through some of the patterns I see in terms of like the richness of the two groups of herbivores um, in relation to, well, relative to the instability in space. So if we're looking at um, the uh, along the latitudinal, um, the latitudinal axis, 
we see that um, the uh, species richness of Fort at Herbivorous seems to be localized um, to this latitudinal band. Um, that represents basically the subtropics and tropics. So um, whereas high at herbivores are uh, distributed across um, the latitudes, more or less at the same, the same numbers. Um, and so we already we sort of see that um, for for at herbivores, they're already they're only occurring in places that have relatively uh, more stable climates. Okay. Um, when we look at um, the patterns of richness across um, the latitudinal uh, axis, we see again that um, <coughs> for at herbivores um, are mostly um, localized to. Uh, these, this latter longitudinal line, which just basically represents Africa. So they're mostly, there are a lot of like um, artiodactyls that are um, only, just only found in Africa. And so when I looked at um, the uh, effect of uh, instability on uh, the change in range size, I found that for both groups, it seems that instability does um, result in changes in um, the, the size of uh, species ranges. Um, and um, so these these numbers represent, so there's um, the, the negative numbers represent, uh, I calculated relative the range size um, of the, uh, in, the, in the present um, relative to uh, the last spatial maximum. And so negative numbers uh, represent uh, uh, Losses in range size, whereas uh, positive numbers represent gains um, <coughs> in range size since the last spatial maximum. Um, and uh, the the effect of inst the, the negative effect of instability is um, found for both groups, but the effects needs to be stronger for work at reports. And um, and so it seems that uh, from the previous result that. Um, instability uh, does indeed have an effect on on uh, these two groups, and um, I extended it to looking at um, uh, patterns of uh, richness in <coughs> states, and found that um, as as you would expect, um, instability richness uh, does decline with increasing instability in both pine get and forget from uh, fermenting herbivores. Um, but the relationship is much, um, uh, much, uh, it's weaker in the forget fermenters. And um, so the, the regressions were run with um, information from uh, spatial autocorrelation models. And so um, that's why the, the patterns are the sort of fairly flat in relation to the, um, the numbers. But um, so what's what I want you to take from this is that um, what's interesting is that you can see clearly that there's a point of instability at which forget fermenters just don't occur compared to high net fermenters. And um, these these guys are um, occur in, I think, um, our, our species are <coughs> in Libya and Egypt um, and Africa. Um, and that's where those are the areas that experience like the highest instability. Um, so it seems like although um, although uh, richness uh, is negatively impacted by climate, past climate instability as, as we would expect in both groups, it seems like there's something else going on in the forget for uh, forget um, herbivores. There's just like uh, it's, it seems like they're, they're more sensitive to um, instability than high get herbivores. And I tested this by looking at, by comparing the instability of areas in which um, they were uh, extubated since um, the last glacial maximum, and um, in areas where they, in areas that were stable, so where they were continuously on, um, uh, where they con continuously occurred from the last glacial maximum to the present. And so th that's what the, the left panel um, is a comparison um, for areas where both forget and hindget herbivores were um, extirpated 
um, and um, in those areas, instability was much, much higher. So it seems like um, the forget, uh, that uh, forget removalers um, uh, were um, much uh, more sensitive to the, the um, um, instability, whereas there's no different, there's no significant difference um, in uh, the continuously stable areas from the two groups. So, um, so I just want to end by saying that um, um, that uh, despite the um, hypotheses about uh, the ecological consequences of the two strategies, it seems like um, um, just looking at the uh, simple relationship between richness and climatic fluctuations, that the strength um, of the relationship is not stronger for four-year herbivores, um, but that's because um, it seems like uh, these uh, lineages are just much more sensitive to instability than um, clients or any other kind of herbivores. Um, so this, the, my findings from this part show that uh, not only um, does a um, does a, a biotic um, a factor uh, niche with, but also climatic instability uh, affects uh, diversity at this scale. Okay. And um, in conclusion, uh, I found that um, in this sort of gray area where we previously didn't have a very good understanding of uh, how biotic and EBI factors should affect um, uh, diversity, um, I found support for um, both um, biotic um, factors, such as niche width and the mode of fermentation, as well as um, abiotic factors um, for the ecological opportunity and historical climatic stability um, that uh, <coughs> operate at large spatial scales and long temporal scales. And I guess um, I just wanted to end by saying that um, it seems that given all of my um, often like the contradictory results that I found um, relative to like the models that uh, uh, we typically use to look at these um, patterns. It seems like um, there's a, we have like an opportunity to like stand back and um, incorporate more of the biology of the species and um, our specialized knowledge about these species instead of relying on these um, <coughs> models um, that are overly generalized generalized. Um, and so that's kind of ending. I'd like to acknowledge um, all these people um, who are uh, essential during my PhD um, in terms of like providing like um, um, you know set, uh, like really helpful feedback and also helping keep keep me sane. Um, so my uh, advisor Ms. Mills, my community members and all of my um, the, the community at um, the University of Michigan um, and the funding sources. Okay. So, <coughs> so any questions? So basically, it was just a rough measure of. I was trying. I also tested um, the dietary breadth, um, but because of the the scale at which I looked, um, because of the, the phylogenetics 
scale, like um, there, I did the, the data um, were sufficiently wide enough to capture uh, detection differences, and so it has to drop the dietary drug, which is a more direct um, test and clearly more biotic. Did you take into account, or how did you take into account your comparison between Africa and Asia, whereas Africa is one large land mass, whereas Asia is split into peninsula and islands and so on, which would certainly uh, strongly influence the rate of speciation in that area. Right. So how, how does that figure in, if at all? Right. So that's, that's part of the idea. Right, and that like um, I found support for a change in speciation and morphological diversification rates only in Asia because they had more ecological opportunity available to them in Asia, um, and you know that that was you know in the form of um, uh, just available habitat, uh, available suitable habitat. So that's implicitly part of the comparison because it's directly tied to the effect. So, so when you say speciation rate, do you mean net diversification rate, or do you mean speciation, speciation rate? Speciation rate. Yeah, because um, um, I only looked at speciation rates because um, it's hard to interpret um, excretion rates from uh, molecular phylogenies, um, and so uh, you can count, you can like estimate like programs like BAM and other uh, models can um, give you. Uh, Speciation and excretion rates from which you can calculate net diversification, but um, because it's because of problems with the interpretation, I just stuck with speciation rates. So I do mean speciation rates when so, I'm talking about so, these. So things. I mean that was related to my I've got a yeah. follow up with. Um, so mammals fossilize pretty well. Can you think? Do you think you could build that into your phylogenies and see whether that changes your results? Yeah, so uh, that is something I've been thinking about a lot, um, but um, I would have to collaborate, I think, with paleontologists and people who know a lot more about fossils than I do. Um, um, yeah, so like that's definitely something I can like, um, do. That would be a good future direction. But I guess um, like the, the shape of the phylogenies should tell us something about the extinction events that happened, sort of. But um, yeah, but you're right that without explicitly incorporating like fossil data um, into the molecular phylogenies, which has that, which I think, which is a like burgeoning field um, of macroevolution that you know, like a lot of people have worked on, like Graham Slater, in terms of like looking at like morphological, incorporating fossil information into um, reconstructions of morphological um, evolution. It's um, it's definitely something I can look at in the future. I, It'd be interesting to see if the results would hold. My inclination is it'd be quite different because the expectation for extinction in Africa and Asia is, oh, is really well, different. Oh, well, for sure, for sure. Because um, in, I didn't talk about this at all, but um, in Africa, um, Africa has actually experienced a lot more um, extinction uh, in Columbine monkeys than in Asia. But that's because I think there are problems with um, the uh, fossil, fossil, fossilization in the intermediate areas um, where they disperse from Africa to, because it was like Eurasia. Um, but there are fossils in those areas. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.